welcome to Global Academy of Medical Education. I am Dr. Kavita and I'll, I am your faculty in microbiology. Microbiology as a discipline is integrated intricately with all infectious diseases of pan-spanning most, most syndromes. So, choosing all the topics and trying to... Uh, Trying to discuss all of them will be difficult, but uh, in order to uh, cover comprehensively the entire subject, we are going to discuss 18 major topics that have been asked or are probable questions that may be asked in the upcoming FMG examination. So, we will begin with uh, bacterial growth curve and we will also discuss about biofilms. No discussion of microbiology is complete without discussion of uh, culture media. About microscopes, we are going to discuss the types of microscope. We will also discuss about urinary tract infection that uh, has been covered in all, all the other subjects as well. Non like medicine um, and gynecology and obstetrics. And also we will discuss the causes of non-gonococcal urethritis. We will discuss about the bacterial cause of acute pyogenic meningitis, then about cystodes with reference to the tapeworm and about the cysticercosis. In malaria, we will discuss about the different plasmodium species as well as the, uh, the diagnostic features in uh, microscopy and uh, about plasmodium nolesi. And then we will move on to visceral ishmaniasis or kala azar. And then we will move on to viral hepatitis, the different types of hepatitis uh, uh, viruses um, and their uh, uh, hepatitis with special reference to hepatitis B surface antigen. Also, the newer techniques of sterilization and disinfection is important. HIV has been covered very briefly and in immunology, we will pay emphasis to hypersensitivity and types of ELISA. Moving back to bacteriology, we will discuss the serotypes of the diagenic strains of Escherichia coli. Then uh, about tuberculosis, uh, some emphasis on the types and the classification of tuberculosis. Then we will move on to the rickettsial infections and lastly we will cover helminths. So uh, with the physiology of bacteria, the first questions uh, that usually uh, arise from are from the bacterial growth curve. So, mostly we are familiar with the growth curve and we know the four, four phases which is the lag phase, log phase, stationary phase and the phase of decline. So, uh, how do we, how do we perform, uh, find out a bacterial growth curve in a suitable liquid culture media like in peptone water or nutrient broth, we will inoculate few colonies of the bacteria after which we will plot the number of microorganisms in relation to time. So there we are going to find that there are four phases, which is the first phase is the lag phase. So in the lag phase, the bacteria is getting familiar with the unknown environment and therefore it will start multiplying. Uh, it will, uh, I'm extremely sorry, it will not, it will increase in size and increase in, uh, it will start uh, producing more metabolites. So, in the lag phase, there will be no increase in number of the bacterial cells. It will only multiply and reach its maximum size. In the log phase, the bacteria will divide uh, by binary fission. As a result, the, um, uh, the axis will move um, uh, up, upward and therefore there will be increase in the total count of the bacteria because the bacteria is actively multiplying and um, there is um, the size of the bacteria is of normal size and there um, it is multiplying and producing daughter cells by binary fission in the stationary phase in the stationary phase since the metabolites have now exhausted and therefore, in the stationary phase, the, there will be some bacterial cells which will die as a result of which the total count and the in the viable count, viable count refers to the living bacteria that will be uh, decreasing and total count includes the live and the dead bacteria. So, uh, the total count will be higher than the viable count. 
and in the phase of decline since the metabolites have uh, uh, almost exhausted the more bacterial population will die as a result the viable count or the living cells will decrease in number but the total count which consists of both live and dead bacteria will remain same so this is the summary of the various phases of the bacterial growth curve to note is that bacterial division does not take place in the lag phase in the first phase there is no bacterial division and um, bacter there is no bacterial death and in log phase the bacterial de uh, de bacteria divide and towards the end of the log phase the bacteria die in the stationary phase there is balance between the number of cells that are dying and the number of cells that are being produced by binary fission and therefore there will be in the stationary phase there will be also known as the plateau phase and in the phase uh, decline in the stage of decline there will be total count will remain the same while viable count will decrease so the special features for the lag phase is that uh, the cells assume the maximum size there is accumulation of metabolites and enzymes in log phase the bacteria are metabolically active they are small size or normal size and they are uniformly stained by gram stain and in stationary or the plateau phase there due as the uh, enzymes and the metabolites are decreasing they um, they will produce pores the environment becomes unfavorable and therefore the staining will be gram variable and also exotoxin antibiotics bacteria uh, bacteria seen uh, these will be produced and decline phase there will be production of involution forms so let us take uh, the very simple basic mcq which is maximum cell size in bacterial growth cycle is seen in lag phase log phase end of plateau phase and phase of decline so this is on basis of our previous discussion that the maximum cell size in bacterial cell growth cycle will be lag phase so true regarding lag phase time taken to adapt in the new environment growth occurs exponentially plateau in lag phase is due to cell death and it is the second phase in the bacterial growth curve so the, um, the first um, first uh, um, option is the answer because it is true that the lag phase is the first phase of the bacterial growth curve it is the time taken to adapt in the new environment and growth uh, does not occur exponentially the bacteria do not multiply they reach their maximum size and they keep on producing metabolites and en enzymes there is no cell death in case of no cell death in case of lag phase and it is definitely the first phase so this option is also wrong it is the second phase in bacterial curve so next is about biofilm now what are biofilms so biofilms have assumed importance in uh, clinical setup because on patients who have been uh, on a central line or um, intravenous catheter so certain bacteria they uh, they have um the tendency to produce a matrix of extracellular polymeric substances so this is uh, these are communities which are uh, in which the bacteria they accumulate and by uh, pheromones they communicate with each other which is known as quorum sensing so these two terminologies are important one is a matrix of extracellular polymeric substance and communication with each other by quorum sensing now what are the bacteria that are implicated in production of biofilms so biofilms are commonly seen in coagulase negative staphylococci previously in um, we used to ne neglect or uh, over neglect or think that coagulase negative staphylococci are not are not pathogenic but uh, in uh, number of cases in patients who have been on prolonged antibiotic therapy or immunosuppressed due to steroid therapy 
um, or on central line central venous catheter they are responsible for producing bloodstream infections so uh, when we perform blood culture if we find that in um, repeated vein puncture if we isolate coagulase negative cephalococci from two different sites um, or on repeated blood culture then coagulase negative cephalococci may be playing a pathogenic role so staphylococcus epidermidis it is the most common cause of biofilm producing bacteria others we have is group d streptococci which is enterococcus faecalis also we have uh, streptococcus viridens escherichia coli and klebsiella pneumoniae and proteus mirabilis and pseudomonas aeruginosa so this is the um bacteria which are mostly producing biofilms most common we have is staphylococcus epidermidis which is a coagulase negative staphylococci so a brief revision of the coagulase test so coagulase test it was first uh, to differentiate between staphylococci and streptococci we used to perform the catalase test and uh, catalase if positive it will be next we will perform the coagulase test uh if coagulase staphylococcus test is positive then it forms into uh, falls into family micrococci micrococci which consists of micrococcus which are non pathogenic and staphylococci staphylococci and staphylococcus staphylococcus we will again divide on the basis of the coagulase test so there are two types of coagulase test one is the tube test which is confirmatory and one is the slide coagulase test which is um, um, on the basis of the bound coagulase so if we found that if we find that uh, the the coagulase test is positive then most commonly we have is the pathogenic is staphylococcus aureus and also other pathogenic may be staphylo uh, coagulase positive may be intermediate and hicus staphylococcus hicus so these are also coagulase uh, positive coagulase negative we have a lot of example one is staphylococcus epidermidis then we have staphylococcus uh, saprophyticus which is a cause of uti in sexually active preg or uh, young females Sacro saprophyticus Uh, staphylococcus um, epidermidis saprophyticus so these are the common uh, uh, coagulase negative staphylococci schlieferi there are lot of other species and um, now after a brief discussion on the um, physiology of bacteria as well as the biochemical test let us move on to the culture media so culture media uh, there may be questions where we will find directly um, uh, directly asking about identification of the media but i will uh, discuss certain properties by which we can divide this uh, de uh, decide what kind of media it is so uh, first is this is the this is the simple uh, basal media simple basal media and liquid media simple basal liquid media so it may be peptone water it may be nutrient broth depending upon the color and the constituent will be uh, just uh, peptone plus nacl plus water it does not contain agar now the simple media that is one classification and another we have is complex media where we have enriched selective differential media so when when this is the example of blood agar blood agar it is uh, made up of sheep blood usually or it, we can also source human blood so blood agar is opaque red in color and uh, we, it is also a uh, indicator media because we can on the basis of hemolysis which we are going to see subsequently we are going to we are able to differentiate the bacteria so um, so uh, blood agar it is a enriched media because it is enriched by uh, human blood or sheep blood so concentration of blood is 5 to 10% and uh, this is the heated blood agar heated blood agar which is also known as chocolate blood chocolate agar 
heated blood agar also known as chocolate agar for fastidious bacteria what are the fastidious bacteria we have is uh, for example uh, hemophilus influenzae it may require the growth factors which are present in uh, chocolate agar and um, uh, then um, next we have another enriched media this is enriched using egg coagulated hen's egg this is a lowenstein jensen media lowenstein jensen media which is used for the culture of mycobacteria so we can differentiate between the colonies of mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium bovis mycobacterium tuber first we have known uh, we must know the constituents it consists of coagulated hen's egg which in uh, hen's egg which is makes the uh, medium enriched and we also have malachite green which acts as the selective agent also gives the color to the medium and also we have mineral salt solution aspergin so these are the constituents of the, uh, um, the of the lowenstein jensen media so we can differentiate between mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium bovis uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis it has got rough tough and buff colonies and uh, bovis it has got smooth and uh, creamy colonies so by which we can differentiate so this uh, if uh, if this media is provided with a history of urinary tract infection then this will be a clay dagger which is commonly used for the urine culture in urinary tract infection so it is cysteine lactose electrolyte there is no space to write electrolyte deficient agar so there will be a history of the um, symptoms of urinary tract infection then we have this is the maconkey agar this is the maconkey agar maconkey agar is a differential and an indicator media the indicator system present here is neutral red which will give two types of colonies either it will give pink lactose fermenting colonies or pale non lactose fermenting colonies so pink colonies are lactose fermenting are seen in lactose fermenters like escherichia coli where the colonies are moist and pink and um, also uh, klebsiella species klebsiella also will give mucoid colonies and non lactose fermenting colonies there are lot of examples like uh, shigella salmonella as well as there are um, uh, the proteus there are late lactose fermenter who for give uh, the give the color after uh, give the color of uh, pigment after uh, 48 hours after pink colonies will be seen after 48 hours example is shigella sony in blood agar there are three types of hemolysis there will be beta hemolysis alpha hemolysis and gamma hemolysis so beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis there there will be um, 4 to 5 mm breakdown of the rbcs around the colonies in alpha hemolysis it is partial hemolysis where we will see that there is 1 to 2 uh, mm of uh, zone of hemolysis which is uh, also gives a greenish discoloration around the colonies and gamma is no hemolysis so next this is the chromogenic agar chrome agar where we can identify the different species of the fungi different species of the fungi will give different appearance different color colonies and also the other important media which is used for fungal culture is saboroids dextrose agar media so previously we had discussed this is the this is not a media this is the catalase test so here is an image of catalase test 
The reagent used is 3% hydrogen peroxide and in a catalyst positive organism we will see effervescence, production of effervescence. This can also be performed in a, performed in a uh, tube where we also find effervescence. And this is the slide and the tube coagulase test which we see, which we have seen ahead, uh, which we have discussed ahead. This is the positive slide coagulase test where we, we can see clumping. So we will make an emulsion of the uh, colony in the normal saline and we will add plasma to it and gently rock the slide to see if there is clumping present and it is slight coagulase positive and we tu in tube coagulase we will inoculate in the diluted uh, saline with plasma we will inoculate the colonies and look, look for coagulation. So this is a positive tube coagulase. So tube coagulase is the confirmatory test between the slide and the uh, slide and the tube coagulase. So th there is a question which sometimes have been asked which is the following organism can be cultured in artificial, cannot be cultured in artificial media. So uh, the answer here will be uh, these are the list of the organisms which cannot be uh, cultured in artificial media. First is Mycobacterium leprae, second is Treponema pallidum which causes syphilis. Rickettsia, they are obligate intracellular and they cannot be grown in artificial media. Also, Chlamydia and Rhinosporidium seaberry, which causes rhinosporidiosis and Pneumocystis gyrovici. So, a question that is familiar but may, uh, may be discussed here in context of media is Loeffler serum slope. It is again an enriched media, which it, uh, uh, from the name it is suggestive Loeffler serum. So it causes it has serum which can be used uh, to enrich the media and it is used for the isolation of there are four options Clostridium tetany, Haemophilus influenzae, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Corinibacterium diphtheri. So the answer here will be Loeffler serum slope is uh, answer is Corinibacterium diphtheri. So in uh, Corinibacterium diphtheri, uh, we, it is a basically a clinical diagnosis and we cannot wait for the laboratory confirmation or the microscopy of the throat swab. So Corinibacterium diphtheri, certain points I will discuss here. So first is the, it is known as the Klebs Loeffler bacilli. Klebs Loeffler bacilli on the basis of the names of the discoverer. And it is arranged in a pattern known as the Chinese or the cuneiform pattern. Chinese or the cuneiform pattern. Also, um, a Chinese letter cuneiform pattern. We use three main stains of which Albert is most common. Albert, Nisser and Ponder stains are used. Where we can see some uh, bacilli, green bacilli with... Uh, uh, bluish green green bacilli with uh, bluish green metachromatic granules bluish green metachromatic granules also known as volutin granules also known as babes earnest granules babes earnest granules and uh, corinibacterium diphtheri uh, this is the throat swab findings and uh, we can uh, we will see a, a grayish white pseudomembrane uh, uh, over the tongue in a uh, over the tongue or the oral cavity um, in a uh, child who is unimmunized against diphtheria and um, uh, there will be um, the respiratory distress so uh, after the we immediately suspect and uh, provide antitoxin administer antitoxin we will uh, then send a throat swab and uh, regarding the culture the media that uh, can be used is um, uh, potassium telluride blood agar potassium telluride blood agar that will give blood uh, black colonies which is uh, selective media but it gives results after 48 hours. In contrast, Loeffler serum slope, which is an enriched media, it will isolate the bacilli in 4 to 6 hours. It will grow the bacteria in 4 to 6 hours. So it gives uh, the diagnosis, uh, early diagnosis. So this was about Corinibacterium diphtheri.
so in media we have to discuss about blood culture so this is a monophasic media so you might have seen it in the wards this is the conventional blood culture media conventional blood culture media and uh, which is monophasic and also we have automated uh, automated uh, bottles for uh, uh, the bacteria alert system but in most hospitals where we do not have laboratories where we do not uh, do beyond con conventional this will be the monophasic media and biphasic media it is also known as the castaneda method this i will explain in a while uh, in monophasic media there will be uh, this is the brain heart infusion broth brain heart infusion broth we are going to collect the blood aseptically using all aseptic measures we are going to introduce the blood into the blood culture media and uh, this we are going to send to the laboratory and what are the indications of blood culture the most important indication of blood culture is enteric fever also we have is in uh, infective endocarditis also we have septicemia where we perform blood culture pyrexia of unknown origin pyrexia of unknown origin and last is the uh, brucellosis so here with brucellosis we are going to perform the castaneda method so here there is a solid slant and a liquid culture media so in those bacteria which uh, uh, take a lot of time to uh, later take a lot of time to grow in the laboratory in a suitable car we use a solid slant and a liquid culture media so so we do not need to repeatedly subculture it if we tilt the bacteria and the liquid culture media will in come in contact with the solid media and we can look for the growth now this question has been we'll move on to the next question which is on the basis of the antibiotic sensitivity now antibiotic sensitivity the technique here used is antibiotic sensitivity the technique here used is i will move on to this space so that i can accommodate the points this is the kirby bar disc diffusion method kirby bar disc diffusion method where we are going to look for the zone of inhibition zone of inhibition and here we will place the antibiotic disc in a concentration uh, pre mentioned concentration and we will look for the antibiotic zone of inhibition and we will uh, determine whether the antibiotic is sensitive intermediate or resistant to the uh, particular strain and the media used the here it is important the media media used is muller hinton so there may be a direct question most important media in re relation to the antibiotic sensitivity it is muller hinton agar so microscope next our topic of discussion is on microscope um, and in microscope we will discuss the parts because parts uh, maybe it is covered in other uh, uh, subjects but uh, regarding the parts of the microscope uh, there may be some questions so we have to know uh, first which is the ocular lens so this is the ocular lens or the eyepiece lens so first we have is the eyepiece lens and then we have the objective lens now objective lens is of uh, three um, five uh, four uh, types one is the low power which is the 10x low power and then we have is the high power lens which is 40x and then we have is the oil immersion objective so these three are mainly used in microbiology oil immersion lens which is 100x and eyepiece may be 5x or 10x magnification so uh, about the ocular lens so yeah, and this is the, the the third lens is after the eyepiece and the objective lens we have the condenser lens which is closed by the aperture condenser lens which is below the stage and we place the slide on the specimen on the stage 
and for uh, oil immersion we will add a uh, oil for example most uh, in, most commonly used is the cedar wood oil which is used uh, between the slide and the objective lens so that the refractive index of the slide and the oil and the lens are the same and the direction of the light uh, it is um, so light is source of light is from below in case of light microscopy the source of the light is from below and we have the specimen um, where the objective lens will magnify it and the ocular lens will add to the magnification and then we will see an enlarged and magnified image via the eye uh, through the eye so now uh, there are two concepts like uh, magnification and resolution. So resolution is the ability to differentiate between two closely placed objects. Like two objects as two separate objects. Two closely placed objects as uh, two separate objects. So this is the importance of uh, the microscope and uh, for every um, uh, microscope we have to know resolving power of the uh, eye uh, unaided eye as well as that of the light microscope and the electron microscope so uh, after the light microscope discussion so we usually normally use light microscope discussion for light microscope uh, uses for staining for seeing the stained slides like gram staining we can differentiate between gram positive and gram negative bacteria we can also um, perform the motility by seeing the hanging drop experiment so after light microscope we move on to the phase contrast microscope so phase contrast microscope it utilizes the property that there in between a cell there is a difference in thickness within the cell or there is difference in the refractive index and um, that property is utilized so that will be difference in phase and will give a 3d image and um, also we will uh, it is mostly done for living cells and it can detect microbial motility and also endospores and inclusion bodies here we have is a image of saccharomyces cerevisiae which can be visualized where depending upon the uh, the phase contrast in the cell wall it is the live cell in dark ground microscope we detect uh, on the those which cannot be stained by normal stains like gram stain we will uh, which are because very slender in nature that cannot be seen in the light microscope we utilize the dark ground microscope most commonly it is used to detect treponyms for syphilitic ulcer discharge and also to uh, detect leptospira from suspected patients we are going to see uh, one more clear image where we will see the syphilitic uh, the isolation of the treponym from the syphilitic ulcer so here the background is dark there is a dark field stop which will uh, obstruct the light and the light will come from the side and it will um, uh, it the object will be um, be in a dark it will illuminate the object will uh, find we find as illuminated in fluorescence microscope we tag a fluorescent dye uh, to the target bacteria most common uh, dye, dyes are the fluorescein isothiocyanate and also we can use acridine orange or rhodamine and in immunofluorescence dye is tagged to conjugated with an antibody the other uh, microscopy we have is uh, electron microscope so electron microscope here instead of light we use a beam of electron and the organism is freezed uh, it is known as freeze etching we can directly visualize from the species for example we use uh, rota for the detection of rotavirus from stool we can see uh, the we can visualize using the uh, the uh, electron microscope we will see that it is like spoke wheel pattern uh, we can identify from the stool and the technique used for electron microscopy it is either shadow casting or negative staining or freeze etching so other types of microscope is we have interference microscope based on the 
quantitative measurement of the chemical constituents of the cells like the lipid proteins and the nucleic acid polarization microscope which is based on the difference in, in birefringence confocal microscope where we use a computer to see a 3d image and inverted microscope which helps us in cell culture so this is the slide i was talking about previously the method of diagnosis we have is this is a uh, this is the treponema which we see is in the spiral form and there is a special kind of motility which can be seen which is known as the corkscrew motility in the dark brown microscope the answer we have the method of diagnosis will be dark brown microscope i have discussed it and this is a special kind of motility known as the corkscrew motility and since we have discussed about uh, uh, motility let us know other special kinds of motility so motility there will be other examples swarming motility swarming motility it is uh, seen in blood agar which is uh, by proteus species proteus vulgaris and proteus mirabilis also it can be seen by clostridium tetani and corynebectum diphtheri so this may give give a swarming motility that is seen in blood agar so after corkscrew motility and swarming motility very famous kind of motility is darting motility darting motility is seen in case of vibrio cholerae darting motility then we have tumbling motility tumbling motility which is seen in uh, listeria listeria monocytogenes tumbling motility then we have lashing or the gliding motility lashing or the gliding motility which is seen in mycoplasma so these are the special kinds of motility which can be um, which are can be asked as one liner questions now in uh, first syndrome that i have covered is urinary tract infection so in urinary tract infection there is a concept of asymptomatic bacteria in which there is occurrence of actively multiplying bacteria without any symptoms now most common organism in urinary tract infection it implicated is escherichia coli it accounts for 70 to 80% of the infections produced by escherichia coli about about urinary tract infection and in catheter associated urinary tract infection which is a part of the hospital acquired infection we have again we implicate escherichia coli as the most common organism and most common organism in sexually active female is a uh, uh, coagulase negative staphylococci which is staphylococcus saprophyticus so regarding a urinary tract infection if we are collecting the uh, pa patients from whom who are not catheterized or they can uh, give urine on their own we will uh, collect the clean voided clean catch midstream urine sample and um, uh, normally we do not perform wet mount we will directly proceed with culture uh, normally we do not produce uh, for, uh, perform the gram stain but in case we perform gram stain we will look if we find one bacilli per high power field it is an indicator of urinary tract infection but always culture is confirmatory uh, we culture it in mcconkey agar and uh, clay agar if it if available which we have seen earlier clay or cysteine lactose electrolyte deficient agar uh, if it is available we will perform on clay which will support the growth of both gram positive and gram negative bacteria it also supports growth of the candida species and it can differentiate between the lactose fermenting and non lactose fermenting bacteria so there is a concept of significant bacteriuria which was it which is also known as cas criteria which is quantitative count examination of colonies so more than or equal to 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml it is diagnosed as urinary tract infection but there are certain exceptions for example in uh, even less number of colonies may be significant when the organism is staphylococcus in case of catheterized patients in uh, case of hematogenous infections like acute pyelonephritis which is an upper 
upper UTI and patients on antimicrobials if if, if a significant number of colonies are even not found, even then we will proceed with the antibiotic sensitivity. Next, we move on to non-gonococcal urethritis. So, gonococcal urethritis, here we see a very nice image where we see that there is a gram-negative diplococci which are kidney-shaped intracellular seen inside the neutrophils. So, there are two bacteria which are um, in pairs they will be uh, resembling uh, the kidney beans or the kidney shaped and they are the gram negative diplococci which is uh, cause of gonococcal urethritis. Now there are conditions where there will be uh, other bacteria, viruses, parasite and fun fungi which may give rise to uh, urethritis which is examples are we have to know this list which is Chlamydia trachomatis, Uriplasma urilyticum, Mycoplasma hominis and persistent L forms of gonococci and viruses such as herpes, cytomegalovirus and parasites like Trichomonas vaginalis, Gardenella vaginalis and fungus like Candida, fungi like Candida. Next we will move on to the next topic of discussion which is meningitis. So before we deal with um, uh, acute bacterial meningitis. First, let us know the uh, clinical feature, characteristics seen in the uh, normal individual CSF and the pyogenic tuberculosis and the viral meningitis. So, CSF pressure will be measured in millimeter of water. It is highly elevated in case of pyogenic meningitis and moderately elevated in tuberculosis and viral it is uh, very slightly elevated. The leukocyte count is very very high in case of per millimeter cube uh, 100 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 5 uh, leukocytes per neutrophil. The neutrophil count is very high. The predominant cell type is neutrophil. The glucose count is low because the bacteria is multiplying and utilizing the glucose as the source of uh, energy and the total protein is usually high. So about pyogenic meningitis, these are the characteristics. Here in tuberculosis, the total leukocyte count will be uh, not elevated. It is very low and predominant cell is lymphocytes. So glucose is slightly decreased and uh, total proteins will be moderate to marked increased. And in viral meningitis, it will be uh, CSF pressure is normal and leukocyte count is uh, almost same like tuberculous meningitis. Again, lymphocyte count will be um, uh, predominant cell type will be lymphocyte. The glucose level will be normal and uh, normal or slightly elevated protein. Now, if we perform, we can do a direct microscopy uh, using the technique of gram staining and uh, we are going to see images but first let us know what is the appearance in the CSF of specific bacteria. So, gram positive cocci in pair or in flame or lanceolate shape. So, this is the uh, appearance. So, they are mainly capsulated. And occurring in pairs, this is suggestive of streptococcus pneumoniae. So we will see as a halo. This can we can perform a uh, uh, India ink preparation, India ink preparation, or we can do a, even a gram staining, where we can visualize the capsule as well as two gram positive bacteria which are um, having a capsule around them. In gram negative uh, diplococci. Capsulated with adjacent signs flattened, which is lens or half moon shape. This is um, uh, about Neisseria meningitis. This is Neisseria meningitis. Also, capsulated and gram negative bacilli, which is pleomorphic, it is hemophilus influenzae. And uh, gram negative capsuli, uh, caps, uh, gram negative bacilli arranged singly, maybe Escherichia coli arranged haphazardly or singly. And gram positive cocci in short chain, maybe Streptococcus agalecti. So, in the gram positive uh, in short chains, I should have uh, used the other color, which is gram positive and gram negative, ideally. And gram positive short bacilli will be Listeria monocytogenes. So here is the image. 
so you see you see when uh, pneumococcal india in preparation we exactly we have seen uh, capsule and we will see lanceolate or flame shaped lanceolate or flame shaped uh, uh, flame shaped um, uh, the cocci which uh, uh, lanceolate or flame shaped which are capsulated and occurring in pairs so next is the nisseria this is the streptopneumococci pneumococci seen in india in preparation and next we have is the uh, the capsule capsulated which is uh, uh, nisseria meningitis here also we see intracellularly and uh, in nisseria meningitis intracellular we see the uh, two bacteria which are flat uh, lanceolate shaped and capsulated and this is the gram negative bacilli capsulated which may be pleomorphic which is haemophilus influenzae and this is the gram positive bacteria uh, uh, gram positive which is listeria listeria monocytogenes so what is the cause of the meningitis in the particular age group so in all group, age groups streptococcus pneumoniae is the most common cause of community acquired meningitis and here about nisseria meningitis it is there are 13 sero group so mostly it has been a, um, the serotype sero group a c x y and w 135 has been covered by vaccination hence the incidence has lowered and type B is responsible for majority of the invasive disease. Type B is cause of majority of invasive disease. And infants, we see group B streptococcus and listeria monocytogenes. It is um, seen as an uh, important cause of meningitis in units. And in unvaccinated children and adults, we have hemophilus influenzae. So after one uh, acute bacterial meningitis, uh, meningitis, we will move on to a topic on parasitology. So parasitology, I have included uh, cesto, first cystodes. So if we remember the broad classification of the helminths, we can be divided into uh, platyhelminths and nematelminths. And platyhelminths, we had cestodes and trematodes which are the flukes and the uh, nematelminthes, we had the nematode. So here we are discussing the cestode. Now morphology of the cestode, it is in adult, it is a flattened ribbon like creamy white in color measures about 2 to 4 meter. And this is the, uh, the two uh, species are the tenia uh, solium and the tenia saginata. Tinea solium and tegens and here is the embryo egg of the tenia species which is a hexacanth embryo hexacanth embryo it consists of six pairs of hooklets hexacanth embryo so this is uh, the morphology of the adult worm which consists of the head region which is known as the scolex and the neck region and the uh, strobil neck or the strobila and then there is the tegument which consists of various segments of um, of a variable length it is flattened tape like and it consists of uh, long chains about 2 to 4 meter in length long chains and in the for there are the gravid segments in between the gravid segments now here we see a hydrated cyst which is also it which is caused by echinococcus granulosus that is known as the dog tape worm. Here a dog is the definitive host and the intermediate host we have is the sheep, cattle or the humans. The infective form is the eggs and the larval stage is known as the hydrated cyst. Here we see that there is an intact hydrated cyst that has been um, that has been that is being um, extracted and um, here here we see that three layers of the cyst which consist of the pericyst outer layer the ectocyst which is the inter intermediate layer and the inner cyst which is known as the endocyst and here we can see um, in the, here there are the brood capsules which is the uh, tiny larval form so each of them are the dotted cyst and here it is a 
filled with the liquid and it consists of certain granules known as the hydrated sand moving on to this slide which is on malaria so malaria i would like first to know uh, first to discuss about the life cycle because if we know the life cycle we can discuss further topics on laboratory diagnosis so life cycle malaria we know that there are five species uh, plasmodium vivax falciparum and um, ovale melary and nolesi fifth type we have found is plasmodium nolesi now in the uh, there are two host man is the intermediate host where we have the asexual cycle and uh, uh, the sexual takes place sexual cycle takes place in the female anopheles mosquito i think it's mentioned here female anopheles mosquito here we will begin the cycle so it uh, infective form to man is the sporozoites which is there in the sa salivary gland of the mosquito so when a man gets bitten by the uh, mosquito which is the female anopheles mosquito the sporozoites they enter into the blood stream of the man so all species of the sporozoite are cleared from the blood stream and they reach the liver so in the liver there is the pre erythrocytic schizogony pre erythrocytic schizogony so the sporozoites it will um, uh, it will um, uh, change morphology to trophozoite inside the uh, say, say liver cell hepatocytes that will give rise to pre erythrocytic schizont so from the sporozoite trophozoite pre erythrocytic schizont and ultimately merozoite and some of the merozoites they will instead of reaching the blood circulation after being released some will be converted uh, into uh, into hypnozoite that is responsible for the relapse of the a bacteria a relapse of the um, malaria which is uh, seen in case of uh, plasmodium vivax now once the merozoites again enter into the blood circulation they will enter the rbc where the erythrocytic schizogony takes place the rbc uh, is uh, attacked by the merozoites and inside the um, rbc there will be a, a formation of the late trophozoite and immature schizont and mature schizont and then uh, some of the merozoite they will in, uh, they will uh, continue the cycle with the uh, continue the cycle with inside the more rbcs and uh, then some of them will be converted to some of the merozoites will be converted to gametocytes which is different in case of male and female gametocytes of plasmodium falciparum and uh, plasmodium uh, vivax ovale and melary will have different shapes of the gametocytes now the infective form to the mosquito is the gametocyte so here we have to remember that the sporozoites the sporozoites which was the infective form to the man is not the infective form to the mal malaria it, in here it is the gametocytes which is the infective form to the malaria uh, mosquito and it is uh, enters into the blood circulation and um, here the, my, the the male gametocyte is also known as the microgamete and the female gametocyte is also known as the macrogamete so both will enter into the uh, gut of the via the blood meal it will reach the um, uh, it will reach the gut of the bacteria uh, gut of the female anopheles mosquito and fertilization will take takes place resulting in a zygote that will enter the mid gut and uh, the, the zygote will develop into a oocyst and then the mature oocyst will contain the sporozoite which will again be reaching the salivary gland of the uh, mosquito and that will be released into the um, uh, uh, again when the mosquito bites the uh, female uh, um, female anopheles mosquito bites the man it will give rise to the same cycle in another um, a sexual cycle in another host so this is the spread of the malaria uh, first uh, important is definitive host where the sexual cycle takes place is the um, female anopheles mosquito 
and uh, the sporozoids which are the infective form to man and then asexual cycle in the man where um, sporozoids will first reach the pre erythrocytic schizogony in the liver and erythrocytic uh, schizogony in the rbcs some of the merozoids will become gametocytes and gametocytes will be the infective form to the uh, humans uh, to the mosquito and here they will multiply in the stomach it will be gametogony taking place in the gut of the malaria and gut of the anopheles mosquito and that will result in development of oocyst and the cycle will be repeated so laboratory diagnosis till now conventional light microscopy we have the thick film and the thin film which can which we can stain with lishman stain romanovsky stain which is the uh, gold standard for confirmation also we can perform quantitative uh, here we will do a thick stain a thick smear and a thin smear in the thick smear we can uh, uh, chances of isolation of the malaria uh, parasite is higher and the thin uh, smear we can lo look for the specific diagnosis so conventional light microscopy is the gold standard for confirmation stained by the romanovsky stain like lishman commonly performed we can also perform a quantitative buffy coat examination which will give a more sensitive than the thick blood smear also important is like in areas where there is no facility for the staining we can do sero diagnosis which detects these three antigens are um, very important Hist histidine rich protein 2 and parasite lactate dehydrogenase and aldolase so this has been asked and these are the three protein which is uh, uh, being detected histidine rich protein two parasitic lactate parasitic lactate dehydrogenase and aldolase also we can detect uh, in uh, we plasmodium knowlesi we can perform pcr so features of various species is important before we see the uh, image of them let us discuss the different kinds of um, diagnostic forms seen so diagnostic uh, forms in the um, plasmodium vivax we have in the trophozoites which can be de detected the schizons and the gametocytes and it also has the trophozoites assumes the ring forms but in case of plasmodium ring forms will be multiple multiple ring forms acoli formation there will be acoli formation and there will be gametocytes which may be banana shaped male and female gametocytes and in plasmodium malaria and ovale we find similar um, uh, morphology like the plasmodium vivax trophozoite schizont and the gametocytes so in fact the infected red blood cells are enlarged mostly in cases of plasmodium vivax these are enlarged and ovale also it is enlarged and uh, the falciparum and the melody these have got normal morphology now the dots present are known as the schufner's dot in case of plasmodium vivax and it is known as morer's dots or morer clefts in case of plasmodium falciparum zeeman's dot in case of plasmodium melody and james dots in case of plasmodium uh, ovale now other features we have is relapse which is due to the hypnozoids and recrudescence which we are going to discuss subsequently in case of plasmodium falciparum there is recrudescence and plasmodium ovale there is relapse so here we see that in the plasmodium um, uh, ring form there is a single ring in case of plasmodium vivax the rbc has been enlarged in size and here uh, there will be multiple ring forms and double dots so this gives a headphone appearance multiple uh, rings and headphone appearance Also, there may be acoli formation where it is pushed to the periphery of the RBC. The ring form is pushed to the RBC. Yeah, and in plasmodium, malaria and ovale, there are single ring forms. And late trophozoite, which is seen in the erythrocyte, 
this is the feature and schizons we uh, know it is known as the Schuffner's dot and here it is known as the Maurer's cleft and in case of um, plasmodium malaria it is known as Zeeman's dots and here it is uh, the James dots and male and female gametocytes here in way, very characteristic of falciparum they are both banana shaped. Now difference between relapse and recrudescence in malaria. Uh, so most commonly it is seen in plasmodium falciparum followed by plasmodium malaria. It is the drug resistant parasites which, uh, which are there even after completion of the treatment. And in plasmodium malaria long term recrudescence are seen as long as 60 years. This is due to long, long term survival of the erythrocytic stage at a low undetectable level in the blood. And relapse it is like few sporozoites they do not develop into pre-erythrocytic schizone but they remain dormant and they are known as the hypnozoid for 3 weeks to 1 year and reactivation of the hypnozoids it will lead to initiation of the erythrocytic cycle and the relapse of malaria. So there are certain points which is important about plasmodium nolesi because it is the newest, um, it is the latest uh, um, protozoa, latest malarial uh, species that has been identified plasmodium nolesi. It is a par malarial parasite of the monkeys but can also rarely affect humans. Main vector here it is not female anophilis, the species is uh, leucospirus it is the main vector and in india it has been documented from andaman uh, islands and acute illness with um, relatively high parasitemia the paroxysm of fever it occurred daily it is known as quotidian malaria because of the short rbc cycle 24 to 48 hours clinically it resembles vivax but severe malaria is frequently seen and it, compared to Vivex, it infects all stages of RBC. In laboratory uh, diagnosis, blood smear examination, well, nolesi is indistinguishable from uh, falciparum, shows multiple ring forms, acoliform and double dot ring forms. And the late trophozoid is present with band form and round gametocytes which are morphologically similar to that of malaria. Next, we move on to leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis which is also uh, known as Kala Azar, Kala Azar or black fever. So it is in our country is endemic to um, endemic to leishmaniasis and it is caused by obligatory intracellular protozoa of the genus leishmania which primarily affect the reticular endothelial cells. It exists in two morphological forms. One is the MST goat, which is the diagnostic form. So this is important that MST goat, which is found maybe in the bone marrow or the lymph node or the blood, not commonly in the blood, but it is uh, splenic aspirate. Here it is the diagnostic form, MST goat, but the infective form is the pro-MST goat. Pro-MST goat is the infective stage in the man, which is found in the insect vector, which is the female sand fly. Flavotomus, flavotomus species, vector is transmitted by, by flavotomus argentipis which is the female sandfly vector. Now clinical forms, uh, viscera leishmaniasis or calazar affects viscera such as spleen, liver, uh, bone marrow, there is a huge hepatosplen, huge splenomegaly. And post colazar dermal leishmaniasis occurs may occur few months or years following treatment with antimonials for visceral leishmaniasis. It may also occur in cutaneous form, various forms of cutaneous leishmaniasis, diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, dysmaniasis recidivans, and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Depending on the geographical location, we divided into old world and New world leishmaniasis. So old world leishmaniasis, it is uh, seen in Asia, Africa and less frequently in Europe and it is transmitted by the sandfly of the genus Flavotomus. And here uh, we see that Leishmania and Donovanian infantum which is known as the Leishmania Donovani complex. 
it causes both visceral leishmaniasis and post kalaza dalman leishmaniasis the other cause of visceral leishmaniasis is a new world leishmaniasis new world leishmaniasis which occurs in central and south america transmitted by the sand fly of the genus luzomia so leishmania donovani infantum and chagasi these are the three causes of visceral leishmaniasis and other causes of cutaneous leishmaniasis is leishmania tropica mexicana and brasiliensis which causes cutaneous microscopy is the mainstay of diagnosis of uh, visceral leishmaniasis we can stain using leishman gimsa or right stain and here we found no the leishman donovan bodies also known as the lord uh, ld bodies LD's bodies is the gold standard method for diagnosis. So, finding the LD bodies in the we can use the splenic aspirate or the bone marrow to uh, find the LD bodies. Here we see in the macrophages that is uh, it is the the image shows bone marrow smear stained with gimsa. There is a nucleus here. There is a nucleus and there is a rod shaped kinetoplast. What is the kinetoplast? kinetoplast is the first is the axoneme axoneme is there in your uh, which is the uh, root of the flagella axoneme is the root of the flagella and uh, the kinetoplast is the thick mitochondrial dna multiplicated forms of the mitochondrial dna and then we have the other diagnostic modalities this may be uh, the culture so it can be done in um, some uh, culture fluid which is known as the nnn medium novi macneil nicol medium novi macneil nicol medium which is the also uh, named after the discoverers novi macneil nicol medium and we can also use a insect media like schneider's drosophila drosophila insect medium so here the amastigotes they transfer transform into promastigotes in the culture fluid and then we can after the, the promastigotes are formed we can detect in the gimsa stain now we are going to discuss a topic in virology which is about the viruses causing hepatitis now the hepatitis viruses there are five strains Uh, the with the what are the five strains which is hepatitis A virus, B virus, C virus, D virus, and E virus. So let us discuss each of the uh, properties of the uh, each of the viruses. The common name. So we know uh, certain features are known to us like hepatitis A and E. They will be. Uh, hepatitis A and E, this they will be uh, uh, through fecal route. They are transmitted. So they are. Uh, it has got the common name hepatitis A and E. Let us discuss together. It is hepatitis A is known as infectious hepatitis. It is where uh, um, it is uh, through fecal route. It is transmitted. And hepatitis E virus was given the common name non A non B. enteric transmitted hepatitis so uh, then uh, about the genome so all the uh, okay let us take one at a time first the common name hepatitis a and e it is infectious hepatitis and non a non b enteric transmitted hepatitis which is via the fecal oral route now we have is the um uh, hepatitis b c and d virus hepatitis b virus is the most important cause of serum hepatitis which is blood borne and hepatitis c is known as post transfusion hepatitis or non a non b uh, post transfusion hepatitis and d is the delta virus which is an incomplete virus also known as delta agent which will depend on the hepatitis b virus dna for its multiplication now belonging to the what family is the viruses they belong so first is the family uh, hepatitis a virus it belongs to picorna viridi it is also an enterovirus 72 you know picorna viridi enterovirus 72 and then we have is the hepatitis b virus which is hepa dna viridi 
హిపాడీని విరిడి అండ్ హెపటైటిస్ సి ఈజ్ ఎ ఫ్లావీ విరిడి ఫ్లావీ వైరస్ అండ్ ద డి వైరస్ ఈస్ అన్క్లాసిఫైడ్ అండ్ హెపటైటిస్ ఈ వైరస్ ఈజ్ ఆల్సో అన్క్లాసిఫైడ్ లైక్ క్యాల్సి క్యాల్సి విరిడి నౌ జీనస్ ఈస్ వి హ్యావ్ టు నో ద జీనస్ విచ్ ఈస్ ఇన్ కేస్ ఆఫ్ ఇన్ కేస్ ఆఫ్ హెపటైటిస్ ఏ ఇట్ ఈస్ హెపటో వైరస్ ఆర్థో హెపాడీని వైరస్ ఇన్ హెపటైటిస్ బి హెపాసి వైరస్ ఇన్ హెపటైటిస్ సి డెల్టా వైరస్ ఇన్ హెపటైటిస్ డి వైరస్ అండ్ హెపీ వైరస్ ఇన్ హెపటైటిస్ ఈ నౌ ఈకోసా హెడ్రల్ సిమెట్రీ సీన్ ఇన్ హెపటైటిస్ ఏ అండ్ ఈ ఈకోసా అండ్ ద రెస్ట్ దే ఆర్ ఆల్ స్పెరికల్ సిమెట్రీ అండ్ ఓన్లీ అగైన్ ద హెపటైటిస్ ఏ అండ్ ఈ దే ఆర్ నాన్ ఎన్వలప్డ్ నాన్ ఎన్వలప్డ్ వైరసెస్ అండ్ ఎన్వలప్ ఈస్ దేర్ ఇన్ కేస్ ఆఫ్ హెపటైటిస్ బి వైరస్ అండ్ సి వైరస్ అండ్ డి వైరస్ అండ్ దిస్ ఈస్ అనదర్ జీనోమ్ ఈజ్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ ద జీనోమ్ ఈజ్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ బికాస్ హెపటైటిస్ బి వైరస్ హెస్ డబల్ స్టాండర్డ్ డిఎన్ఏ అండ్ రెస్ట్ ఆల్ ద వైరసెస్ దే హ్యావ్ సింగిల్ స్టాండర్డ్ ఆర్ఎన్ఏ so this is a important feature which you remember all the viruses are single stranded rna all the viral hepatitis um, um, the viruses are uh, single stranded rna except hepatitis b virus which is double stranded rna now about other properties of hepatitis viruses they are uh, the onset of the illness it is abrupt it is abruptly when the person is a uh, child or any age young adult is exposed to the hepatitis a and the e virus by uh, the um, uh, virus it will be hepatitis a and e onset will be abrupt onset will be abrupt and the rest the, those which are blood borne these will have insidious onset insidious onset it will take a uh, long time to manifest the incubation period is long and um, the age group is important the age group where um, uh, the age group affected will be children and young adults in case of hepatitis a and e and uh, the hepatitis b virus may uh, uh, occur in uh, due, since it is blood borne it may occur in any age group like it can occur in adults and uh, hepatitis c is more commonly seen in adults hepatitis c is more common in adults any age group and similar to b virus hepatitis d virus also now um, hepatitis a and e i have already mentioned a la- number of times that it is fecal oral route and in case of uh, hepatitis b c and d it is uh, blood is the most common route and uh, followed by in hepatitis c it may be sexually transmitted and uh, also there may be vertical transmission from mother to fetus mother to child incubation period it is since it has got an abrupt onset in case of hepatitis a and b it has got a small incubation period average is 30 days and here it is average 40 days for hepatitis a and e it is longer incubation period in case of hepatitis uh, b virus c virus and uh, um, d virus where it may be up lasting up to 6 months of incubation rarely um, rarely none of the hepatitis a and e and a b and c they have rarely fulminant disease but fulminant disease is frequently seen in hepatitis d virus and uh, in pregnancy the chances of uh, fulminant disease increases to 20 to 40 percent in case of hepatitis e virus so carriers are seen in case of hepatitis b and c so hepatitis b and c they may be carriers in 0.1 to 30 percent cases and also in hepatitis c chronicity is common in hepatitis c virus 85 percent uh, and uh, hepatitis d also common oncogenic definitely hepatitis b virus we uh, vaccinate the every uh, individuals of all age group because the hepatitis b virus have got oncogenic potential and um, secondary attack so uh, other features secondary attack rate is high in case of hepatitis a virus it spreads from 
one uh, patient to another host one uh, infected person to another and also secondary attack is um, one to two percent in case of hepatitis e virus and what are the complications so complications of uh, complications of uh, hepatitis b virus it may lead to hepatocellular carcinoma cirrhosis autoimmune disorders like acute glomerulonephritis arthritis polyarteritis nodosa hepatitis c virus may lead to hepatocellular carcinoma cirro cirrhosis autoimmune acute glomerulonephritis arthritis cryoglobulinemia and d virus hepatocellular carcinoma cirrhosis and fulminant hepatitis prognosis uh, like the depends on the excellent in case of hepatitis a and also good prognosis in hepatitis e and hepatitis b virus depends upon the age at which the infection occurs like the younger age the more severe symptoms the duration in which the virus is infecting and prophylaxis we can give vaccine in case of um, and when the person is exposed we can give hepatitis immunoglobulin and recombinant vaccine also as prophylaxis we can give recombinant vaccine inactivated vaccine is also there in case of hepatitis a and vaccine against hepatitis e is known strain is hev239 which is only in china and no vaccine for hepatitis d virus only the hepatitis b virus is itself protective so about the hepatitis b virus now we have to discuss in detail because the genome and the antigenic uh, uh, antigenic uh, variation that is important and has been asked so now the, all the di discussion will be about hepatitis b virus we have had a uh, di uh, differences we know about the, between the other viruses hepatitis a to e but hepatitis b virus it can occur in three form one is the spherical form one is the tubular form and this is known as the d uh, den particle which is a sp um, entire complete form spherical form with uh, envelope so it consists of the following antigen so first we have is the surface antigen hepatitis b surface antigen and then we have is the hepatitis this is the surface antigen present in the surface inside which we have the envelope antigen and inside we have is the core antigen hepatitis b core antigen and then we have is the uh, the, the partially double stranded dna so this again is the re recapitulation that all the viruses were single stranded rna virus causing viral hepatitis except hepatitis b which causes um, which has uh, double stranded dna so now about the hepatitis b surface antigen it was previously called as australia antigen and antigenically it is complex it consists of two component a common group reactive antigen known as a epitope and two pairs of type specific antigen which is dy and wr D and only one member of each pair being present at a time. Therefore, four subtypes of surface antigen are seen. One is the ADW, AYW, ADW, AYW, ADR, and AYR. So these are the four subtypes of surface antigen. Now, uh, also the hepatitis B virus genome. It consists of four overlapping genes, which is the S gene, C gene. X gene and P gene. S gene code for the surface antigen, and it has three regions: the S gene, pre S one, and pre S two. Uh, and C gene consists of the pre core and the core region, which code for two uh, nucleocapsid protein. Pre core codes for envelope, and uh, C region codes for hepatitis core antigen. And P gene is the largest gene and codes for polymerase protein has three enzymatic activity, which is the DNA polymerase, RNase H, and reverse transcriptase activity. And um, X gene, if present, it signifies poor prognosis. And in the core region, uh, the core antigen it cannot be seen because it is enveloped by the hepatitis B E antigen. Now we we will summarize the on the, what are the features of the antigenic markers, the antibody markers, and the other molecular markers for the laboratory diagnosis of hepatitis B. 
First is the antigen marker, which is the three antigen marker we have is the hepatitis B surface antigen, envelope antigen, and the core antigen. So surface antigen is the first marker to appear. So this is a very important feature. We are doing the immunochromatic uh, chromatographic test. We can also perform ELISA, where first we will detect following the onset of the symptoms hepatitis B surface antigen, which which is elevated in both ac uh, acute, chronic, or in carriers. Envelope indicate envelope antigen if present, it indicates. Active viral replication and high infectivity. So this is also an important point that um, uh, envelope antigen, if present, then the virus is multiplying and it has got high infectivity. And core antigen is never detectable in serum because it is marked by the uh, because it is marked by the envelope antigen, but can be detected in hepatocytes by immunofluorescence test. Next, what are the antibody markers? We have the antibody to the core, anti core antigen. This is the Ig. If it is IgM, it indicates acute hepatitis. And if it is IgG, it appears in chronic hepatitis or carriers or after recovery. So, antibody to the hepatitis B core antigen is important. And antibody to the surface antigen. It is a marker of recovery or vaccination. An anti hepatitis B uh, anti hepatitis B envelope antibody, low viral replication and low infectivity. Other molecular markers we have is the hepatitis B virus DNA detection, which indicates active viral replication and high infectivity. And DNA load will also help us in monitoring the treatment response. And non-specific markers we have is elevated liver enzyme and serum bilirubin indicates a clinically active infection. So our discussion without uh, revising the important features because that will help us in determining the stage of the disease. So I need to um, recapitulate it again. Surface antigen is the first marker to appear and elevated in acute chronic or carriers. Surface antigen. Then we have envelope antigen which is an implication of high infectivity that the bacteria uh, virus is multiplying. And core antigen not detectable in serum except by immunofluorescence test. And antibody markers we have is anti-hepatitis B surface antibody which if IgM indicates acute hepatitis and if IgG appears in chronic hepatitis or carriers or after recovery. Anti-hepatitis B surface antibody is marker of recovery or vaccination. Antibody to the surface antigen. So, anti-hepatitis B code was indicating anti acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis or carrier if it is IgG and uh, surface antibody is marker of recovery of vaccination and envelope antibody indicates if it is antibodies there low viral replication and low infectivity. If hepatitis B virus DNA can be detected again it is uh, marker of ac active viral replication and high infectivity. And viral DNA load helps in monitoring treatment response. Non-specifically, liver enzymes and serum bilirubin indicates clinically active infection. So, without seeing the last part, which is the interpretation, let us find uh, if the surface antigen is raised. So, if surface, it is the first marker to appear. So, it will be there in chronic infection. It will be there in acute infection, chronic infection, and even in recovery. So, um, and you see that the second parameter is provided is that the envelope antigen is positive. So, it infects that high infectivity and here the anti-hepatitis B code which is the first antibody marker to appear. This is the IgM and there is no anti-hepatitis B surface antibody or the envelope antibody. So, here the interpretation will be it is acute hepatitis B virus infection and since envelope antigen is there, it is highly infectious. Next, we move on to the second condition in which we see that there is surface antigen. First, then there is envelope antigen, surface antigen is there, then we have envelope antigen. We have uh, antibody to the uh, uh, we have antibody to the core antigen which is IgG. 
so it will uh, of course from uh, it can be suggestive chronic infection with high infectious because envelope antigen is there and the other two markers are absent next we have is the hepatitis b surface antigen is there and envelope antigen is absent so low infectious state and surface antigen is there means there will be some infection that has occurred or it may, it may be can it may be carrier state or as well carrier state as well so here igg to the antibody to the anti hepatitis b core antibody is there and here the it consists of chronic hepatitis b virus or carrier state with since ig envelope antigen is absent it is low infectious and if only antibody to the surface antigen is present then it will be immunity following hepatitis b virus infection uh, which is suggestive now after a discussion on virology let us move to a topic of general microbiology where we will discuss two commonly asked questions on which is about the technique of sterilization and disinfection one is important to be confuse always between inspissation and tindalization so inspissation we is a, using a equipment known as inspissator where media where it is a process of uh, by which a media such as lowenstein jensen media which i have told is used for the culture of mycobacteria and low flush serum are rendered sterile by heating at 80 to 85 degrees celsius for half an hour on three consecutive days so this is inspissation it is temperature it is a uh, te technique by which the temperature is maintained less than 100 degrees celsius less than 100 degrees celsius so here temperature at 100 degrees celsius is tindalization where it is uh, consist of heating the substance to boiling point or little below boiling point and holding it there for 15 days 3 days in succession so tindalization and uh, inspissation are difficult different uh, temperature 80 to 85 degrees celsius in case of inspissation and in case of tindalization it is just at 100 degrees celsius a little less than that and it is also three consecutive days for 15 minutes so newer techniques of sterilization it is uh, important because it has been asked or is, is being asked currently first is the ethylene oxide what is ethylene oxide it is a colorless liquid with a highly penetrating action highly penetrating action and it is uh, it is a um, at acts at room temperature where it alkylates alkylization of the protein dna and rna takes place and these are oxidizing chemicals so ethylene oxide and next we have is the paracetic acid concentration is 0.23 uh, percentage and uh, for hydrogen uh, peroxide it is 7.35 percent it has got microbicidal activity which it can inactivate in um, microorganisms within 20 minutes except bacterial spores and uses for disinfection of hemodialyzer so this may be asked like for the disinfection of hemodialyzer and um, we use in plasma sterilization we use this hydrogen peroxide there is a brand name which may like uh, there has been a question like sterad is the tech um, instrument used for um, the sterilization by plasma sterilization now about glass gas plasma it refers to any gas which consists of electrons ions or neutral particles where chemical disinfectant such as hydrogen peroxide or a combination of hydrogen peroxide and paracetic acid are used to um, induce the plasma there are two commercially available plasma sterilizer which has been available sterad 100s and plaslite sterilizer so you have to remember that this is the uh the uh, the disinfectant used which is hydrogen peroxide uh, ozone about ozone it is a powerful oxidant that contains free oxygen atom and it is widely used for uh, water disinfection in and it can now uh, even for medical instrument it has been cleared by fda it is a broad spectrum it has got broad spectrum microbicidal activity where spores are also killed the sterilization cycle lasts 4 hours 15 minutes 
and temperature is 30 to 35 degrees Celsius and it is considered safe. So this is the ozone sterilizer box which we see they have um, kept the, um, the pipettes, micro pipettes that have been used to sterilize. So in HIV, I have uh, instead of a detailed diagnosis, I wanted to pay attention to the diagnosis of HIV in infant. So diagnosis in a children less than 18 months, it cannot be done because the anti maternal antibodies may interfere in the infant circulation. And um, till 18 months, we can only diagnose HIV by DNA PCR. And uh, in children more than 18 months or adults, we can perform nucleic acid amplification test, P24 antigen assay and serological tests like rapid ELISA western blot which is confirmatory. So moving on to our discussion from jumping from virology to immunology, we have to know about the types of hypersensitivity. So the, what is hypersensitivity? It is the undesirable injurious consequences in a sensitized host following contact with a specific antigen. So depending upon the time interval, hypersensitivity reaction are broadly divided into two groups, immediate hypersensitivity um, reaction which are of three types type 1 type 2 and type 3 and uh, delayed hypersensitivity reaction so the two groups are the immediate hypersensitivity reaction and the delayed hypersensitivity reaction immediate um, the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction it is IgE mediated and it occurs due to mast cell degranulation Type 2 hypersensitivity, it is mainly IgG mediated and occur in response to cell surface bound antigen. And type 3 hypersensitivity, it is uh, due to immune complex mediated, antigen antibody bind, bound complex mediated. It And uh, type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, it occurs due to abnormal cell mediated immune response through a subset of helper cells called T delayed hypersensitivity cell. So moving on to the types of ELISA, it is very difficult to uh, make uh, um, to explain from this slide because it has been very, uh, uh, very um, all the types of ELISA have been included in one slide. So better we move on to the uh, um, detailed description. Uh, we will discuss in the antigen antibody reactions. But here about the indirect ELISA, another topic. Uh, uh, included in uh, and commonly asked in immunology we have indirect ELISA in which the first we uh, have in the micro titer plate we will coat the antigen antigen coated well and there we will uh, add the here we are uh, um, uh, adding the patient serum and uh, where there will be specific antibody which we need to measure so every step we are going to wash after and incubate. So after anti adding the antibody to be measured, we will add the enzyme conjugated secondary antibody and then we will give a uh, substrate that will change color and which absorbance we, which we can measure using um, a spectrophotometer. So the commonly used enzymes we have is the horse reddish peroxidase and the alkaline phosphatase. Mostly horse reddish peroxidase is being used. In sandwich ELISA, in contrast, we will uh, have an antibody coated well. And here we are going to uh, add the antigen. We will measure the antigen. So in um, indirect ELISA, we were measuring the antibody. Here we are add, adding the antigen to be measured. And there we will add the enzyme conjugated secondary antibody. And um, we will add the substrate and measure the color. So two antibodies are required which are recognized by different epitopes. One is the first antibody is referred to as the capture antibody and second antibody as detection antibody. In competitive ELISA there is two, a competition between the free and the labeled antigen. And um, after we add the substrate, there is color formation by oxidation of the substrate into a colored compound. The labeled antigen, it will compete for the primary antibody binding sites with the sample antigen. 
and the more antigen in the sample the less labeled antigen is retained in the wall so there is a competitive ELISA and there will be weaker signal cassette or the cylinder ELISA is modification of the ELISA for testing one or few samples of sera at a time the test is rapid about gives results in 10 minutes so here we see that there is a tri dot assay which is used for the which is a cassette or the cylinder ELISA so jumping from again immunology to bacteriology this is again a topic which has been asked often which is the strains of the diarygenic Escherichia coli so strains of the diarygenic Escherichia coli we have uh, we have antigenically distinct from the commensal E. coli, coli which colonize the intestine. So we can detect the serotypes by agglutination, uh, by serotyping using specific antisera. And these serotypes, they express the enterotoxin or other virulence mechanism which can cause diarrhea. The six strains uh, responsible for diarygenic Escherichia coli, it is the enteropathogenic Escherichia coli. Enterotoxigenic Escherichia coli, Enteroinvasive Escherichia coli, Enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli, and Enteroaggregative and Diffusely Adherent Escherichia coli. Enteropathogenic Escherichia coli, it is used uh, leading cause of infantile diarrhea. It causes attaching and effacing lesions, attaching and effacing lesions of the intestinal mucosa enterotoxigenic name is suggestive it will produce two types of toxin heat labile and heat stable toxin it is seen in travelers diarrhea it causes travelers diarrhea entero invasive e coli escherichia coli it is it produces a toxin known as uh, which resembles the shigala, shigella toxin entero hemorrhagic uh, uh, Escherichia coli is uh, responsible for hemorrhagic colitis and hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhagic colitis and hemorrhagic um, ure uremic syndrome. And enteroaggregative uh, Escherichia coli it for produces um, the stack like pattern, stack pattern of the uh, stack pattern of the lesions. <laughs> Uh, seen in the um, uh, intestinal mucosa, they attach in an aggregating fashion and diffusely adherent Escherichia coli. They are uh, they adhere diffusely. They adhere diffusely to the uh, to the intestinal mucosa. Now about the various properties of the enterotoxin. Where important is no we know that there are three kinds of enterotoxin produced by uh, Escherichia coli which is a heat labile toxin, heat stable toxin and we have the verocytotoxin or the shiga toxin. So enterotoxigenic Escherichia coli, it produces two toxins. One is the heat labile and the heat stable toxin and heat labile toxin, it is uh, resembles cholera toxin in structure and function but it is less potent. So here it is plasmid coded so here there will be two fragments, fragment B and fragment A. Fragment B will help in binding and fragment A will allow the, um, and then fragment B will allow the A to enter which will ultimate uh, stimulate the adenyl, adenylate cyclase and increase the cyclic AMP. Increase the cyclic AMP and here it is similar, it is due to increase cyclic G GMP and um, uh, here also it is plasmid coded and detection is by latex agglutination and ELISA and molecular we can detect the labile toxin by PCR and um, the verocytotoxin or the shiga toxin is produced by enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli and it is so named because they are cytotoxic to the vero cell line and they are bacteriophage coated. Uh, detection is by latex uh, using latex agglutination ELISA molecular using specific DNA probes and cytotoxicity on vero and hella cell line. So key points about the strains of Escherichia coli that is responsible for diarygenic E. coli is 
एंटेरोपैथोजेनिक इट इज एंटेरोपैथोजेनिक एस्टिरिशिया कोलाई इट कॉजेस वाटरी डायरिया इन इन्फेंट्स एंड चिल्ड्रन एंड इट डज इट इज नॉन टॉक्सीजेनिक एंड नॉन इन्वेसिव नो टॉक्सिन नो इन्वेशन देन एंटेरोटॉक्सीजेनिक एस्टिरिशिया कोलाई इट कॉजेस ट्रैवलर्स डायरिया एक्यूट वाटरी डायरिया इन इन्फेंट्स एंड एडल्ट and it produces enterotoxin which is heat labile or heat stable toxin and adheres entero invasive escherichia coli it resembles that of shigella entero invasive it penetrates the hella or the um, hep2 cells in tissue culture and it is plasmid mediated and um, virulence marker antigen this is important in case of entero invasive escherichia coli and here we perform the sereni test there if we uh, introduce the, the in the conjunctiva of the guinea pig if we it will lead to entry invasive strains it will lead to mucopurulent conjunctivitis entero hemorrhagic escherichia coli it is vero uh, uh, cytotoxin escherichia coli vero uh, toxin produce vero cytotoxin producing escherichia coli produces shiga like toxin that inhibits protein synthesis causes hemorrhagic uremic syndrome it can be distinguished by fermentation of sorbitol maconchi agar it is detected it is non lactose forming non sorbitol it will not ferment sorbitol entero aggregative escherichia coli produces persistent diarrhea and gives tacked brick adherence pattern on hep2 cells and along with the diarrheagenic strain we can have uropathogenic escherichia coli which is most common of urinary tract infection in adults moving on to salmonella which causes the enteric fever we have had a detailed description on say, the enteric uh, fever and the uh, uh, salmonella so salmonella it has got three classification uh, which is uh, salmonella is uh, serotype salmonella typhi and paratypha which is restricted to human host and cause typhoid and paratypha fever which is typhoidal salmonella this is the clinical uh, this is the clinical classification non type it has got only human host and non typhoidal salmonella it is the remaining serotype that can colonize the broad range of animals including mammals reptiles birds and insects so typhoidal salmonella will give rise to typhoid fever and enteric fever and non typhoidal salmonella mainly gives rise to gastroenteritis based on the antigenic classification we have the kaufman white scheme based on the somatic o antigen and the flagellar antigen the sero groups based on the o antigen are there are 67 sero groups and uh, based on the h h antigen more than 2500 serotypes of salmonella can be seen molecular classification classifies the salmonella into two species salmonella enterica and bongori and when uh, within salmonella enterica there are six subspecies salmonella enterica salami arizona di arizona houtone and indica so second last topic of our discussion will be on classification of mycobacteria so we have a huge mycobacterium tuberculosis complex which consists of mycobacterium tuberculosis bovis capri and africanum also caneti micro microti and pinipidi and then we have non tubercular mycobacteria which produce pigment in the presence of light uh, which is for mycobacterium marinum and kansasi scotochromogen they produce pigment in the absence of light which is scrofulacium and zulgai and non chromogen is mycobacterium avium and intracellularly do those which do not produce pigment even in the absence of presence of light and rapid growers mycobacterium fortuitum and chiloni saprophytic which may be find in the smegma is mycobacterium smegmatis and mycobacterium flea weakly acid fast mycobacterium is mycobacterium leprae 5% h2so4 so in microscopy we can discuss about the zeal nielsen stain which is commonly performed to stain the acid fast bacilli we use the decolorizer any of the dilute mineral acid which is 20, most commonly 20% sulfuric acid the primary stain we use is carbolfuscin 
which we heat and then we add the decolorizer and then we add the every step after washing we will add the counter stain which is the methylene blue that will uh, stain the background blue and we can see the red acidified bacilli modifications of the zn stain we have is the cold zn stain which is known as the kinion method cold zn stain which is known as the kinion method where we do not heat the carbofustin and we add 1% h2so4 as decolorizer this is used for the diagnosis of the coccidian parasites which causes um, persistent diarrhea in immunocompromised host like in hiv patients moving on to the national tuberculosis elimination program which was the previously known as the revised national tuberculosis control program it is used for the tuberculosis elimination 2007 to 2025 where there will be universal access to quality diagnosis and treatment for all tuberculosis patients in the community and with the target of reaching the unreached and testing and screening is done with patients who presents with fever of prolonged duration cough more than 2 weeks fever more than 2 weeks significant weight loss any abnormality on chest radiograph children with persistent fever and we uh, perform two samples uh, using sputum microscopy for a we perform two samples or at least uh, one early morning sample and one spot sample Next, we move on to features of rickettsia, which we have taken a detailed class as because there is a lot of time repeated question. We have three groups, which is the typhus group and the spotted fever group, and next we have is the orientsia shushuga mushi, uh, causing scrub typhus. Now, if you have seen that video of mine, then you will remember all the mnemonics that I had made for making the topic simplified and to easier to remember. So here, typhus group, we have two species: rickettsia provozaki and rickettsia typhi. And rickettsia provozaki it causes epidemic typhus, which in the long term it is known as the Brill-Zinsser disease, recrudescent form. Here, it occurs in closed communities where there is, a, like in prisons or where there is a number of inmates, which will be high in number. Here, the vector is louse. and uh, spread from one person to another pediculus corporis and important we have the wheel felix reaction which is the heterophile antigen shared between the um, uh, shared between uh, proteus vulgaris and in, in mirabilis strains and rickettsia we see that ox 19 will be highly uh, slide uh, tube agglutination highly reactive and ox 2 will be plus minus and in since there is waning immunity in brill zinsser disease there will be weakly positive or negative reaction in case of rickettsia uh, in brill zinsser disease here i had applied the um, uh, in pneumonic which is ent which is endemic typhus caused by rickettsia typhi and it is flea uh, vector is flea and here uh, the rashes regarding rashes of the typhus group it is spread all over the body except the extremities which is the palm and the sole and rickettsia typhi wheel felix reaction will give ox 19 very highly reactive and ox 2 plus minus then we have the spotted fever group so spotted fever group first species was rickettsia rickettsii this was the pneumonic rrr and here uh, it is not seen in india it is mainly seen in the us where rash occurs mainly in the extremities so this is in contrast to the rashes of the um, the spot typhus group then itc was the pneumonic for indian tick typhus caused by rickettsia conori and rickettsia africa is caused from the name suggestive african tick bite fever and all the three species of the spotted fever group are spread by the ticks and rickettsia occurring it is by rickettsia pox which is seen by gamma seed mites in uh, the typhus group, uh, group we had seen that ox 19 was raised and ox 2 was plus minus and ox 19 and ox 2 are both reactive in case of wheel felix reaction for type spotted fever group rickettsia akari there will be no rea no re reactivity in case of uh, rickettsial pox resembling chicken pox vesicular lesions are seen 
scrub typhus orientia shushuga mushi it is uh, disease is scrub typhus vector is trombiculite mite or the shigar shigar which is uh, the larval form it is seen with the wheel felix reaction the ox k antigen of the proteus mirabilis will be raised lechar which is the site of the entry of the mite it is a black ne black and necrosis with a hyperemic region then about the helminth it is uh, we have seen the cystode which is the tapeworm here we have the um, adult form male and female ascaris lumbricoides which is a nematode here we see that there is a coiled end in case of uh, male ascaris lumbricoides and here there is a vulvar waste in case of female uh, female are comparatively uh small he is longer in size and male is comparatively smaller thinner and with a curved tail end so here there are some common eggs of the parasitic infection infection tinea we have discussed um, ahead that consist of a hexacanth embryo and in trichuris this is a barrel shaped egg with a barrel shaped egg with a mucus plug at both ends mucus plug is seen at the both ends and in ankylostoma we see that there is uh, some blastomeres which is non bile stained and consist of blastomeres non bile stained and blastomeres are seen this is the fertilized egg of ascaris lumbricoides we see a um indistinct uh, thick albuminous coat and it is bile stained and it has got a um, ovum fertilized ovum so finally we have reached the uh, entire exhaustive discussion on um, uh, there are several topics that could have been included and uh, there is no dearth of topics that we can uh, can miss or cannot miss but um, uh, of course there are more topics that need discussion but uh, i will conclude my discussion here i will thank you all for your patient hearing